Herr Bundespräsident Moritz Löhnberger, Frau Dr. Angela, Dr. Angela Merkel, Bundeskanzlerin der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, Mr. Zhang, Mr. Zhang Hei Ling, Hei Ling Vice Premier, dear friends, a cordial welcome to the 36th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Again, we are a true global village. It's a very comprehensive group from all parts over the world. And I would like to share with you four reasons why we are here. First, we know that the big challenges in the world cannot be solved by governments, by business, or by civil society alone. What we need are collaborative efforts of all stakeholders of global society. And here we are, business leaders, politicians, representatives of the media, of academia. It's very important that our discussions are not disassociated of ethical and moral values. So I greet particularly our religious leaders among us. It's very important that we look forward so, a special welcome also to the young global leaders among us. So, a true global community. The second reason why we are here, and I speak on behalf of the business leaders assembled here in the room, the 1,000 business leaders, we are here because we all believe in global corporate citizenship. We all feel so business today has an obligation to improve the global context, to improve the state of the world, because business can only flourish in a world which is not failing. The third reason why we are here is to shape the global agenda. There are many conferences in the world devoted to a specific issue. But here we are, and we look at all facets of the global agenda, at all the challenges. This is a unique opportunity at the beginning of the year, through our interaction, through brainstorming, to see where are the priorities, what are the fundamental issues, and all those issues are interconnected and we take a systemic approach. Finally, and fourth reason, we are here for dialogue and for action. Dialogue is important because the basis for action is mutual trust. We are here to listen each to another, even if we come from different ethnicities, have different values, and different opinions. But through better understanding, we create the basis for action. The theme, the motto of this annual meeting is the creative imperative. Too often, all too often, we apply old re recipes to situations in the world which have completely changed. In this fast-paced world, we need to recognize the changes of paradigms. We have to develop a new mindset, a constructive mindset in building our future. We will be successful in our interaction in the next four days if we apply to this meeting 
not only our brains, but also our heart, if we are passionate about the issues, and if we are compassionate because we recognize that we have to solve those issues as a community. And if we apply also the soul, the vision, to work together for a better world. I would like to, in conclusion, and in reference to the motto of the annual meeting, the creative imperative, quote, a French author, and I translate it into English. He said, every morning, I'm looking out of my window and I see the tree in the garden. And I ask the tree, what's new today? And thousands of leaves respond with one voice, everything. So if at the end of this meeting, we can say something has changed, in our lives, or something will change in our institutions, then we have reached the objective. I have now, I have now the great I now have the great pleasure and honor of asking the president of the Swiss Confederation to address us, to welcome us on behalf of the host country. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our Swiss friends from the Swiss Confederation, from the canton of the Grison, and from the commune of Davos, to thank them most warmly for the fantastic hospitality they are extending to us, and for all the multifaceted efforts they have deployed and are deploying to make our life as pleasant as possible here and to be so hospitable. So thank you very much to everyone, to all those who have helped prepare this year's meeting. And I am delighted to give you the floor, Mr. Federal Councillor and President of the Swiss Confederation. Distinguished uh, Chancellor of the Federal Republic, uh, Professor Schwab, ladies and gentlemen, and I entirely associate myself with everything that has already been said by way of addressing the participants in this meeting uh, by Professor Schwab. Welcome to Davos, ladies and gentlemen. Davos used to be a small mountain village. Without people who believed in utopian ideals, it would probably have remained so. Then along came Alexander Spengler. He wanted to realize his political and social dreams, got involved in the March Revolution in southern Germany, and therefore had to flee to Switzerland. Here he found political asylum and a job. There weren't many takers at that time for doctors' positions in remote mountain valleys like Davos. From this, uh, Spengler developed a treatment for sufferers from tuberculosis and provided inspiration for Thomas Mann's Zauberberg, the magic mountain. Along with the tuberculosis patients, political ideas also made their way to Davos and made it a spa resort, which today seeks new treatments, new therapies for global problems. The name Spengler also served as an impetus in other fields. His son Karl, Karl Spengler, believed that sport was a means of promoting peace and so founded the Spengler Cup. That is the other major event in Davos's calendar. This international ice hockey tournament is a tough competition in which men in full body armor, armed with sticks, race across the ice and plow into each other at full speed. 
in order to win the trophy. And so the question arises, does the WAF annual meeting exist because Alexander Spengler had revolutionary ideas for which he was banished? Or is there a connection between the asylum practices of the young revolutionary Alpine Republic and the present day protection that Switzerland affords the WEF? Or is there a connection between the sporting pacifists and the WEF? These two, this competition between the two world's biggest players. We all know, though, that the logic of cause and effect is not that straightforward. Not every puck that we strike ends up being the winning goal that we wish for. The young Alexander Spengler couldn't have known that as a political freedom fighter, he would find refuge in a mountain village where he would spark off innovations, just as he couldn't have known that 150 years later, those freedoms in which he believed would form the focus of a global debate in this village. And it was not much different for the annual meeting. From being an informal gathering of business leaders without ties to being a globally criticized epitome of ice-cold corporate egoism, and to then becoming a meeting point for figures from politics, business, and culture from north, south, east, and west. But the WAF has also given rise to a good deal outside of Davos. Protests have developed into creative alternative events around the world. In his younger years, Alexander Spengler would probably have mounted the barricades himself against the WEF. But later on, he might have discussed the progression of radical ideas to liberal and democratic values with the German Chancellor at the Open Forum. Despite unpredictability and the impossibility of planning everything, it's still possible to say that there is a need for creative, radical, and at times revolutionary ideas which can be adopted and made acceptable to the majority. There is a need for the state in order to protect this creative space from internal and external threats. And just as in ice hockey, there is also a need in business for a referee to ensure that the match, or in this case, competition, functions properly. It's only in this way that human beings can develop the creativity, which so repeatedly find new answers to existential challenges. And there are examples of this. The mountains that we so much admire used to in, in, induce fear. Avalanches presented a permanent threat to the local population. Today. Thanks to human inventiveness and the political efforts of the community, this risk can largely be controlled and calculated. A tsunami, an earthquake, or a flood is not an act of divine punishment. Neither is it an act of fate that we have meekly to accept. Mankind is capable of learning and of accepting responsibility. It has developed early warning systems with which many natural disasters can be detected in good time. The consequences of an earthquake in Lisbon or Basel would never uh, today be what they were at that time. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were anarchistic extremists who were not afraid even to die for their, for their cause. In the, a, a lengthy political process, uh, the breeding ground for their ideas with, was withdrawn, uh, a process which created social justice and equal opportunities. This political process required, and indeed still requires, an organized community with functioning institutions and political will. And that is also still necessary today. The problems of this world cry out for creative solutions. Some believe that in the battle of ideas, the best solutions emerge on their own with the famous invisible hand of the market. 
However, in order for creativity to be able to flourish and produce results, there also needs to be a framework, and that cannot be created by competition alone. Hungry people cannot be creative because they use all their energy to concentrate on their own survival. That is why the state needs to have a social net. The oppressed cannot be creative because that's why the state has to guarantee and nurture freedom of opinion and the rule of law. Without enlightenment, people are barely capable of being creative because they lack the necessary foundation. That's why there needs to be a state to organize education for all. And in the market, too, the state has to create framework conditions. If only the laws of supply and demand were to apply, there would be no one to ensure that future generations also had an opportunity to find new solutions through creative approaches. We all know that the heavy consumption of fossil fuels is changing the climate and that this is also a cause of environmental disasters. There are many creative proposals for the development of alternatives, but they cannot commit, compete on the market because for the time being, they are too expensive. If the state does not create the right framework for their further development, uh, we risk having an energy gap. The entire global economy would suffer as a result. Threshold countries would be blocked from having access to affordable and clean energy with all the consequences that would have for our Earth's climate. So in the same way that a hockey match is not a battlefield, but rather a game with complex rules that needs to have a referee, so competition too needs a regulator in order for it to function properly and not degenerate into a senseless fight among competitors. This referee is the state with its laws. It is also the international community with its binding agreements on climate protection or the prohibition of torture as well as new institutions such as the International Criminal Court. It is very dangerous to, to discredit the referee for a strong hockey player, but also for a superpower. Because what happens if the state or the international community fails to exercise this referee function? And that can be seen in many crisis zones with the plentiful raw materials. Despite their wealth, the people live in bitter poverty and demand their share of the welfare cake. Some of them tap into pipelines, kid kidnap uh, oil company workers, and often force them to halt their activities. He who would only see in the state a, or the regulator a blocker of business forgets that without guarantees of uh, ownership and property, without contract protection, and above all, social uh, justice and equalization, there are no markets or, filth, uh, or wealth to be had. States are dependent on the creative competition of ideas. That is why they guarantee the necessary freedom for creativity to flourish. But connected with that also is the responsibility of every individual to use these freedoms for the public good and also to put the results to good use. Without creativity, it is not possible to earn much credit for the future, but this credit can only be redeemed through the power of deeds. Thanks to the deeds of one Alexander Spengler, the small mountain village of Davos has become a global center for creativity. Each of us who are here in these days don't wish only to exchange ideas wherever we are, in business or in politics or in culture. We want these thoughts. We, uh, and if we, if we translate them into deeds, then the discussions will have been worthwhile. I wish you all fruitful discussions. Herzlichen Dank, Herr. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Leuenberger. It is a very special pleasure and honor for me to 
Welcome the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, Dr. Merkel. It's not the first time that you are here in Davos, Mrs. Merkel, and I can say with some satisfaction that already in 1993, when you were a fresh minister in the cabinet of Chancellor Kohl, following reunification, we nominated you as a young global leader of tomorrow, and now you are actually a global leader of today. You have returned in past years and 